All right, friends. How are we doing this evening? Awesome. Welcome back to the Roseburg Bible, Pro- Bible Conference. I almost said Bible Project. Uh, my name is AJ, and so glad that you are uh, you're here this evening. You know, uh, Jesus um, in the in the in the stories of uh, in the stories of the gospel. Jesus is asked a lot of questions. Um, he is always being kind of put on the spot. There's this beautiful little book. It's one of my favorite uh, books on the Gospels by a guy named Conrad Gumpf. He wrote a book called Jesus Asked, uh, in which he reflects on all the questions Jesus has asked. Uh, Jesus has asked 183 questions in the Gospel, and he only answers two of them. <laughs> And he gives at least a solid, you know, real answer to two of them. And the reason is that it's really hard to give a good answer to a bad question, right? It's hard to give a good answer to a bad question. Uh, For Jesus, he is uh, often being trapped and people are uh, trying to manipulate him to do uh, what what they want. What we want to do tonight uh, is we, we want to take some time and ask some really good questions of the people who have been so generous to give of their time to be at the Bible conference. Uh, I want to just, first of all, say, wherever he's at, Jeremy, thank you for your hard work to make this possible. Um, and, and, and Pastor Billy as well, thank you for making, the elders at the church, thank you for making this a reality. And would you continue to do it year after year? Because it's a blessing to all of us. So thank you. Um, so what we want to do today, uh, we have uh, Lakita, uh, who preached this morning and is here with us this evening. We have Evan. Yes. We have Evan and we have Scott. And friends, uh, we... <clears throat> Kind of the, the way we'll structure this is I've got some questions that um, I've curated and I've gathered from some others. I'm going to ask those. We'll ask those first, and then we will open it up to you. All right? Does that sound good? All right. Let's, let's give God our time. Thank you for God this evening and the opportunity that we have to be with three of um, God, just the brightest minds that you've given to the church um, as they respond and, and open up to um, the things that we present to them. Would you give them a sense of um, inspiration to say words that, gosh, our hearts need to hear truth? May they not, I pray that they wouldn't feel no need to cut corners. Help them speak truth and speak what needs to be spoken. Um, thank you for this Bible conference and the work you've done here this week. We ask for your favor tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Awesome. Well, let me pull up my notes here. It's, wow, I feel so far away from the three of you. Can I come sit with you, Lakita? Awesome. Thank you. Well, let's, um, actually, the, the first question I want to ask, um, Scott really kind of cues off of your talk last evening. Uh, and the question, you invited us to imagine um, the book of Revelation as a book about discipleship or a writing of, about discipleship. And uh, I can, I think I speak for everybody when I say, it's a really weird time um, to follow Jesus in a partisan world. Um, Would you speak to a group of people that love Jesus? Uh, Would the three of you speak to us about how to be disciples in a wildly partisan moment in history? How do we do that? How do we do that? And uh, the three of you, please uh, feel free to just speak up. No need to um, raise your hand, Just, just go for it. How do we be disciples? in a wildly partisan moment. <laughs> I'll, I'll answer that by talking about Jesus. When I tell my students, the one thing you learn in reading the Gospels is don't ask Jesus any questions because he's not going to answer your question. That's my answer. <laughs> no, the, um, I think there's a lot of things that we, we can do. But um, I think uh, one of the most important things we can do is to take a posture of trying to be peacemakers uh, rather than warmongers. Uh, Elections, the election cycle is endless now. The news cycle cannot wait to get this going again. And it convinces its readers or its listeners to participate in that and to make that the story. And I don't think that should, uh, we should let them make that story for us. And I think that we, we, we can, instead of becoming warmongers at the partisan level, uh, we can become the sorts of Christians that try to see what's good in each party because every four years it's going to change. And a lot of times it's going to go back and forth. And I've lived long enough to know that we've had 
Republican and we've had Democratic presidents, presidents and the United States hasn't gone to hell uh, in spite of the apocalyptic drama that happens every four years. So we, we're going to make it. It's going to be all right. And the day after election, I always have something on my Substack or blog that Jesus is still the Lord. Yes. And, and we're going to be fine. Yeah. So, so I think we can be peacemakers in, in better ways than we are today. I mean, is it all right if I go? Uh, so something I encourage our church in San Diego in at home uh, is to look at John's gospel right in the, the dab smack center of John's gospel is what I think John's perfect picture of discipleship is. And it's, it's this disciple who doesn't even identify by his own name in so far as he identifies as I'm, I'm the disciple who Jesus loves. And, and we know that this is John, the writer, and he's saying, I'm the disciple who Jesus loves, and my posture is to lean back on the very breast of Jesus and to look out at what's going on in the rest of the world from that posture. And he looks out at Peter, he can see Judas, he can see everything. And so that's you know, a, a paradigm that I try to pawn off <laughs> on our church for where, where is the disciple of Jesus in a world that's about to go kind of nuts? Like, what's about to happen in the next 24 hours? for the disciples post Last Supper is going to tear them apart. And of course, Jesus is gonna bring them back together again. But, but leaning back on Jesus' chest, what do you hear when your heart, when your ear is on someone's, on someone's chest? You hear their heartbeat. You hear how their anxiety levels are regulating. You hear Jesus' heartbeat. And notice Jesus, he actually has a, something like a panic attack in that moment. It says that he like greatly distressed talks about who would betray him. And John's right there with him, almost like, who is it, Lord? I sense, I sense your heartbeat in this moment. I'm pressed up against who you are. And so that, to me, is the ultimate posture uh, for a disciple of Jesus Christ, looking out at a world that seems, from our perspective, to go mad. Of course, like uh, Scott talks about, uh, Revelation is an apocalypse. It shows you who's really on the throne. But in the moment when you can't quite see Jesus on the throne, <laughs> you feel like things are nuts. You lean back on him and his body, the church, the Eucharist, the bread, the cup, the silent and solitude, scripture, the things, the basic fundamentals of following Jesus. Lean back on these things, not just to hide, but to look out at the rest of the world. Because only then will you be regulated. Only then will you be like, your heart is tuned to Christ's heartbeat. And then uh, you, you can see the elephants and the donkeys for what they are. They're not the lamb, you know. And so, so that's, that's kind of what we... There's other things, but that's primary. Uh, so, anyways. Um, that was great, guys. Mm. Um, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. And if I am his daughter and I am a citizen of the kingdom, I always pray for the shalom of the city. If I lived in Roseburg, I would pray for this. Shalom, or the peace of Roseburg. I pray for the peace of America. If you were in the first session this morning, I talked about how I prayed every day from the time I was 17 that abortion would be, would be exposed and it would be illegal. But I had never engaged in an abortion. I did, never did anything that would even promote it. I never took anyone to a clinic. On the opposite, I'd be outside of a clinic. I would, um, I never owned a clinic. I was, but I would cry out to God, you know, that he would not judge our country because I live here. Now I live here, but I am a citizen of the kingdom of God. Come on. So I am an ambassador, but I am highly partisan. Mm. Because I don't believe in God and country. I believe in God and kingdom. Because your country can go south. As God said, he causes nations to rise and nations to fall. But we know that he is Lord of all. all. And so there's only one kingdom that is eternal. One. And the kingdom shall rest on his shoulders. Not Biden's, not Trump's, not any human being. No human shoulders can shoulder the weight of the kingdom of God. Only Jesus Christ can, can shoulder the weight of the kingdom of God. 
And our priority must be at all times the kingdom of God. So back in the year, back in the year 2000, I did MTV's Rock the Vote Tour. Yes, yes. And I know you can't tell now, but I was a rapper. And uh, we were the only Christian group that performed around the country on this Rock the Vote tour. And we were at UCLA, and the Holy Spirit told me, I want you to go out, and I want you to recruit, recruit for a new party. And so I did. And he says, I want you to share the gospel, but use no Christianese. You know Christianese. <laughs> yeah, that, that language that the world hears, and they're like, oh, God. So I'm learning how I'm trying to share the gospel in vernacular. And I said, how many of us know that uh, we have, and I mentioned all the problems that were out there, all the issues, and I said, and I'm recruiting for a new party. The party's not on the left, it's not on the right, it's not red, it's not blue, it's not Democrat, it's not Republican. It's about what is right and what is wrong. And through the process of that set that we had, I was sharing the kingdom with us. Now, we won't get to the, you know, to the end of it, which was a great, it was an amazing outcome of it. But as a Christian, we are to never don um, a red shirt or a blue shirt. Because our job is to wear the black and white shirt. Mm -hmm. And whatever sport you're playing, right now football season is a big thing, they got red shirt, blue shirts, orange shirt, Green Bay Packers. They've got silver and black, the Raiders. They've got all these. But there's always a third team on the, sea, on, the, on the scene, no matter what game, even if it's basketball, even if it's soccer, even if it's whatever game is being played, there's a third team, and they wear black and white. And that is our job. And our job is to enforce this rule book, okay? It's this rule book. But you know what I'm saying. I have a Bible app on my phone. Is to enforce the rules in this book. And if someone is wearing a red shirt or a blue shirt, I need to say, that's a foul. That's illegal. That is, you know, you know you're out of bounds. You're and that is our job as Christians. Because that's the only way that we are to earn the respect of the people. As they see us as being above. Because Jesus is the king of Kings, yeah, the king of king of all, and he's the king of kings, and in his kingdom, I'm about his kingdom. Let's go. And we are to pledge allegiance to the kingdom of God above all things. And yes, we are supposed to pray for the shalom of the city. And yes, we are to obey the laws. But when those laws become in contradiction to the laws of God, we are to be dissidents. But we, you, you. The confusion is how to be a dissident because we are so aligned with the world right now in many ways that we don't even suspect right. that we are wow. supporting the world system. Whatever party affiliation you ascribe to, you're mm. supporting the system. Mm. And it's intertwined like the wheat and the tares. Mm. We don't know, but the winnowing has come. But the more we align with this, the more we lay our head on the chest of the master, the more we seek to be dissidents, the closer we are to the kingdom. And as we lift the name of Jesus, we will draw all men and women to Christ and his kingdom. So good. Ooh. So good. Wow. Okay. Yes. All right, so so this is this is a this is a, a Bible conference, obviously, and 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 part of part of what what I think the heart of this conference is is to help um, people engage their Bibles well. How do we read the Bible um, faithfully and, and well? Um, as a teacher, as an educator, this is a common experience to me. I'll have a student who will come into my classroom or my office hours who just watched this incredible TikTok video, and they are convinced they just found the one question Christians for 2,000 years haven't figured out. <laughs> and they are convinced they have this Bible question that will just, it, it's gotcha. Here's, here's a question, two parts. What is one part of the Bible that you still are losing sleep over? As in, you haven't figured out yet. And what do you do when you come across a part of the Bible that is really difficult? What is a faithful way to read the text when it's hard? We'll start, with, Scott, I'm gonna call you first. What, would, you, would you go first? 
I call no these blue parakeet <laughs> passages. Oh, that's good. Um, honest readers of the Bible will find these passages. And it is dishonest reading to suppress what you suspect when you see these passages. They're there. Yep. And uh, we dare not make the Bible fit our image of what it's supposed to be. Yes. We need to let the Bible be what it is. My teacher, Jimmy Dunn, said, let John be John. So let judges be judges. So here's one for me, and I don't have a resolution to it. The story of Jephthah in the book of Judges is pretty nasty. Uh, it ends on an ironic note. He did to her as according to his vow. That's a nice way of saying something nasty. The bothersome thing, I mean, that's a bothersome passage. And that is the uh, passage that led me to write the book, The Blue Parakeet, uh, in many ways, is, is to put these things into a narrative. The problem is that Hebrews raises this as a great man of faith. And I don't like that. And I'll be honest with you, I don't like that. I would not put that man in anybody's honor of faith. But this is the Bible we've got. So we read the Bible and we let the Bible talk the way it talks. And I think we interact with other people. One of the, um, one of the joys of my academic life is that I get to read the, the Jewish Talmud at times. I love to read the Talmud. What I like about the Talmud is that they'll raise a problem and three different rabbis will give an opinion Maybe they'll give four opinions out of three rabbis. And when it's over, they don't tell you which one was right. And I like that because I've been with people who read texts that are problematic and they have a solution and someone else has a solution. And it is in struggling with this that we come to terms with one another about passages in the Bible. Yeah. And there are passages in the Bible that are deeply problematic in the book of Joshua and judges in particular because of war language and death and destruction and it's called harem warf uh, warfare. It's, it's nasty. And I think if we're honest, when we read it, we cringe. And they're cringeworthy. And I think that's how we should respond to it. Rather than say, I shouldn't feel this way. I don't like the passage. I don't like what happened. I don't think that is a morally sensitive question or, or response for a Christian who reads these passages. So it's not that we sit in judgment on it. We sit in questions with it. Yes. Yeah, that's good. And the questions are sometimes the secret to Bible reading. Because I have a question about this. Now, if people tell you not to ask those questions, you tell them not to tell you not to ask those questions. Yeah. Ask those questions because those are your real questions on those passages. So, beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, just I, I say the word "it's beautiful," Scott, because um, there I, I in my at least experience, a lot of the students that I'm bringing up that are coming to class with these questions have for their first 20 years of life been told, "Don't ask those questions." Yeah. And they come to university and finally they get to ask them and they've been suppressed for so long when in reality, those questions need to be cared for and stewarded with tremendous sensitivity. And the worst thing we can do to them is shove them into the darkness. It's okay to allow them to be. So I just, I actually think that's a very beautiful response, a very pastoral response. Yeah. Yeah, Evan Lakita, how would you respond? Um, well, I don't come from a tradition that says don't ask questions. Like I come from a tradition that's like that you know, uh, encourages speaking truth to power. And uh, God does not mind us asking questions as long as we don't mind his responses. <laughs> so, I mean, like Job, oh, you know, Job is like this, that, and the other. And God, tell me, were you there when I hung the Pleiades? No, 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 come. Let's reason together. I mean, <laughs> God wasn't saying that in a nice way. He was, you know, I love the kind of like the cynicism or the sarcastic. Because God has all aspects of our personality, you know. Um, so just prepare for the response that you get. Um, for me, what would be the passages that, you know, I've, I mean, I've questioned lots of passages. 
What was the past? What was going on with Lot when he said, here, take my daughters and abuse them. You know, don't do this. And I'm like, what? Just tell these angels to smite them all. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Offer up your daughters. You know, these are the things going on in my mind. Um, so, you know, I think probably a New Testament one is, you know, when someone takes your one thing, give them your cloak. I mean, let me run this by me. What did you say? I mean, I'm supposed to give them my stuff? You know, there's things like that um, that I don't understand. But when I don't understand something with God, I trust that God is God. And that if I understood God all the time, I would be God. And I am not God, and neither are you. And so there are all, there's going to be lots of things in there that we're not going to understand. Growing up as kids, there are a lot of things we didn't understand about our parents. And granted, they were fallen. Our parents aren't perfect. We realize it more and more when we, as we grow up, our parents aren't perfect. But let's just say uh, there are things that we didn't understand about our parents that as we became adults, we understood why this was the way it was. It was for a good reason. It was because they loved us. They cared about our safety and we didn't like it because I'm 16 and I am grown because when you're 16, you know everything. But um, so I look at it in, in the sense that God has allowed this to happen for a reason. I may try and gain a better understanding, but if I don't, then I trust in his sovereignty. And that as I grow and mature, I may or may not come to that understanding. One day, all things will be revealed to us. Um, well, not all things, but you know what I'm saying. Um, and so I, I, I tend to rely on the sovereignty of God. Mm. So, so you mentioned Job. It's funny, before you, before you talk, Job was the one that came to mind for me. So I have a, a, a mentor, a theological mentor, uh, Dr. Bashir is up at Western who he has this funny talk on Job that he does at churches. And he starts, just to make his point, he starts out by saying, you got a little feedback there. He starts, he starts his Job talk by saying, I hate the book of Job. He starts with a big smile and kind of a, kind of a tongue in cheek. He's like, I just don't understand why God would brag on Job and the result is suffering. And, um, and for me, that, that is still a, an open question. It's interesting, as a kid, the problem I had with Job, <laughs> the problem I had with Job was all his kids die, but at the end, God's like, here's new kids. <laughs> like that fixes it. Um, it's, it, it seems in the text, it seems to fix it in, or at least happy ending it in some way. So, but I've grown to understand, all right, there's cultural stuff happening there as a replenishment of his borders. But, but I'm back to that, that, that question, like all that happened to Job happened because Yahweh Elohim, like the creator of the world, uh, stooped to listen to uh, the complaining of the deceiver. And, and uh, the deceiver, the accuser is running around trying to find someone to, to attack. And God's like, well, have you considered my servant Job? He's pretty awesome. And then everything flows out of that. I'm like, God, I hope you don't brag on me, ever. Um, I hope he never brags on me. And I remember saying that to it. So this is my new processing. Just about a month ago, I was having lunch with a dear friend, godly man. Um, and, uh, and actually, I just baptized this friend of mine last, this last week. So he got baptized. But before he was baptized, we're, we're walking together, walk, talking about the scriptures. And I said this. I said this to him about my problem with Job. I hope God never brags on me. And then, and then this guy goes, well, that's assuming like you're good as Job. <laughs> and I'm like, that is the question behind the question that I'm assuming. I'm assuming God's up there bragging on me that, that, so that I'm, I'm one step further in, in processing my Job problem. I don't think I'm remotely righteous and blame, blameless. Like blameless means blameless. So, uh, yeah, that, that's where I'm at. It still doesn't solve the Job problem for me, but I have other problems in here first. Uh, it's, it's what you say, AJ, like hard texts make soft hearts. And I've seen that happen with that text for me very recently in dialogue with a, a man that I was walking through his baptism with. He like corrected me. So that's, that's my answer there. 
Um, so this this will this will be a, a super easy one um, for you all. Um, so we we are increasingly reading our Bibles in a uh, an age of scientism, uh, a, a sort of cultural moment that that presumes that the a scientific scientistic worldview explains all, all, all things. And um, we love the Bible. We love Genesis 1 and 2. So here's the question. Uh, dinosaurs, go. <laughs> They're so cool. I'm such a dinosaur fan. Yeah. That's, all, that's all I got. Yeah. Though. You have Sinclair gas out here still. So that's... What's that? You got you Sinclair gas out here. With the dinosaurs. Oh, do we? Yeah. With the dinosaurs, yeah. I saw yeah. Noah's Ark right by the wildlife safari, though. You guys, yeah. it landed here, apparently. Yeah. yeah. And then it evolved into a wildlife park. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, t- teach us just a, a, a few general principles about re- reading our creation story in light of our moment in history. How do, how do, we, how do we do that? How do we do that? Well, um, my husband and I sit on the board of BioLogos. Oh, ah, yeah. Uh, which is the, the people, oh, those are those people who believe in creation science. That's not what it is. It's to create a, a safe place for believers to have interaction with non believers about science. Now, usually people just always go to creation, but it's also, you know, I wanted them, I, I need them to really get into the whole aspect of artificial intelligence. I mean, all of the aspects of, you know, science we should be involved in. Science. Uh, Christians should not be afraid of science. Science is only the discovery of what God has already done. He already did it, and now we're just scientifically trying to figure out how we did it and that type of thing. And so uh, even in the Christian world, there are multiple um, views on creation. Some people have a literal seven-day, 24-hour creation. There are Christians who believe that the Bible says a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. And so, you know, Lord, can you tell me? And God said, I'll tell you tomorrow. Yeah, that, that could mean a thousand years, you know. Um, so people see the days as time periods. Some people believe like the, the gap theory of creation that God created everything. And then there was this big gap, you know, Adam and Eve, they were garden for a long period of time or the gap between man and the creation and then all those years go by and so there are there are multiple ways and so um again we're not as human beings as created beings going to understand the creator and everything he did um and when we get to heaven you know he'll tell us okay well this is how i did it well that's great but what i do know is that if we look hard enough and over time, we will realize um, science is the, the study of what God, or the discovery of what God has already done. Um, they found that even uh, the creation itself, this was back in the 90s, they had dozens of Pulitzer Prize winning uh, scientists, um, not Pulitzer, excuse me, I meant to say Nobel. Um, many of them not even Christians, but they had agreed on that the sequence of what happened had to logically be the sequence in how God created the world. So given enough time, you know, I think we'll understand and see things. You're looking at me like, so I'm doing my best. I, like, so Lakita and then Dr. McKnight, all like so accomplished. And I, it's not often you first meet one of your like theological formative heroes the night you're sitting next to him on a stage. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just working on not passing the hot potato to him for every question. So, so what I tell our church, that's how, that's kind of my lens for this whole night. Like I see Q, like Q and A times as pastoral care almost. So, um, what I tell our church, Genesis 1 and 2, the primary questions are not when and how, but who and why. And, 
And so not, you know, when was it created and how did God chemically put together the dust that became human or whatever? That's not what the author is interested in communicating nearly as much, at all as much, compared to who created and why and how he loves his creation, how he's setting up a a temple-like garden that will one day cover the universe in partnership with his, like, image-bearing family, uh, filled with his own spirit. This is, this is who and why. And so questions about, you know, whether it's 6,000 years old or I think it's up to 13.7 billion years old or whatever, like those aren't what the scriptures are concerned with or worried about. Uh, what they are worried about is that you know that there is a beautiful, personal, triune mind that is intent upon fashioning a family after his own image through his his son, through the second person of that trinity coming among us and then bringing us into his family by the power of the spirit from every nation to then continue that partnership. And you're doing it in Roseburg, continuing that partnership by, by, by shining Yahweh's truth, goodness, and beauty all over this county, which I found out is the size of the state of Connecticut. Um, so, uh, so not, not when or how, but who and why. So that's one answer, I guess. Um, I like, I really like your answer. Uh, the problem is there are a lot of people who don't like that answer. And that is a lot of people have complicated the problem for Christians who are scientists, um, in how they talk about creation and how old the universe is and, they definitely don't think it's 13.7 billion years old. So, um, at one point in my life, I was in, uh, I'm into conversion studies and theory, conversion theory, and I realized in studying conversion theory that every conversion requires an apostasy. You have to leave something to become a Christian. And I also realized then that every, everybody who leaves the Christian faith apostatizes, converts to something else. So one summer, I read story after story after story of why people have left the faith. And I I teach, I taught. At that time, I was teaching undergraduate students. And a lot of these stories were by undergraduate students who had left the faith or had left the faith when they were undergraduate students. The number one reason and number two reason combined is a theory of inerrancy of scripture combined with young earth creationism or let's just call it an unscientific approach to creation or to the origins of the world. And I became incredibly sensitive to this question because a lot of my students were scientists. And I had students tell me that they couldn't, they can't believe Genesis 1 through 2 because of what their youth pastor taught them. That if they don't affirm 6,000 or 12,000 or 20, a young earth of some sort, then they might as well just give up the faith. Mm -hmm. And that really bothered me. So I just sort of became um, amateurishly interested in the science and faith discussion. And then one day I was reading an essay by a man named Dennis Venema, who was a scientist at Trinity Western University on um, evolution and on the genome project. And a statement that he made in that project became very important to me. And he said this, and I think that this is held by all uh, uh, geneticists, that the DNA that is currently characteristic of our bodies, humans on the earth today, could not have come from two people. It had to have come from, and at that time they were using this expression, a herd of about 10,000 to come up with the DNA that we have. Well, you know, this not only puts a little pressure on Genesis 1, but it puts pressure on the Noah story as well, because it reduces to eight, which is not left in any record in the genetic, in, in, uh, in history, scientific history. So, Dennis Venema and I met one time at a BioLogos event. And Dennis 
and I applied for a big scholarship to write a book together, and we call it Adam and the Genome. And there's a, a man right there in the middle who has a copy of it, right there, Adam and the Genome. And Dennis wrote the science part, and you probably won't be able to understand that. <laughs> and I wrote the Bible part, and you might not like all of what, what I say there, but I'm right. So, <laughs> so read, read that book. But I have a science friend who wrote, I love the first half of your book. I have no idea what you're talking about, about the Bible. So um, I believe this is my experience as a professor of college students, many of whom were scientists. Don't play a game of telling them not to believe solid conclusions in science. Don't play that game. Let them operate with scientific categories, because science at least measures some measurable realities. Um, and sometimes it's wrong, but it's not totally wrong about everything that it has concluded over time. We go to Dennis because of an accumulation of knowledge that scientific people have, have given to him. So I would plead with you to allow science students to be scientists and not to force the Bible to say things it's not talking about. Yeah. And that's where uh, what Evan said is very important to me. I've never said it so eloquently as you said it. And I can't remember it now because <laughs> I'm nervous about some of these people getting mad at me about evolution. <laughs> But um, I, I think that we need to let the Bible say what it says and not try to make it be science. It's called concordism, and it's not wise to make. Because in 20 years, 30 years, our concordist theories today will be blown to shreds by science. So just let the Bible say what it says. And forget trying to predict the origins of the earth on the basis of Genesis 1 through 3. It, you're not going to do well doing that. So, well, okay. A, a big update. breath. There, there is an update in that, um, you know, that the Bible says that it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, the sciences will change, but the Bible will not. So your half of the book is going to be consistent, <laughs> but your friend's part is going to change. Um, and in this last year, there actually was some um, new scientific research that came out, a geneticist that found that the table of nations is genetically accurate. And that was huge. And you can probably find that if you Google YouTube, there's a Christian guy who's a geneticist and they were finding the, and they weren't even Christians who were finding this out. It was like people had to, oh, had to conceive. Oh, well, I, okay, I guess it's true. So just all you gotta do is wait long enough. Just wait long enough. Um, of course, God has forever, we don't, but. <laughs> you, wanna, you wanna respond again? Yeah, go for it. Uh, it was, yeah, so that, that's why um, Genesis 1 and 2 is, is not how and when God created. It's about who created and why. That, and, and that opens up fully to the scientific endeavor. And it gives full permission. The Bible's not afraid of the scientific endeavor, which is, which is why I love everything you just said. And uh, yeah, not how and when, but who and why. Um, j just as a, a little historical note, um, th th this is kind of scary stuff to talk about, by the way, and I want to give credit to the three of you for, they didn't know I was going to ask any of this stuff. So good job, you guys, <laughs> for handling such hard questions. Um, I, I find it just, uh, if, if, if I were to be asked the same question, I think it's important to note that this is not a new question in the history of the church, and that the earliest, some of the earliest church fathers and mothers wrote a great deal about this. Um, St. Augustine in the fourth century wrote a, a book on the interpretation of Genesis in which he argues that God inspired, this is a beautiful idea, I think, I think it's wildly helpful, that God inspired two books, that God gave us the words of scripture and God also gave us creation to scream his glory. And that both of these books, in Augustine's view, this is early church stuff, that both books are intended to be read together. And that you can't fully understand creation without reading the text, but you can't understand the text without reading creation. I think that's a, I think that's an interesting way to think about this. Uh, Scott, do you want to... Didn't Augustine say something like this that 
if you are interpreting the Bible contrary to solid scientific conclusions. Now, he didn't quite use that expression. He said, think again about your interpretation. That was the fourth century. Yeah. 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 This leads to a question I wanted to ask. And again, I'm, I'm tossing you hot stuff here, hot potatoes, um, because we got a group here that's hungry. All right. Group here that's hungry. Hot potatoes. Hot potatoes in Roseburg. Rosebud? Didn't you call it Rosebud this morning? Rosebud. That was pretty clever. I thought Rosebud. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Pray for our state a lot. Let's pray for us. Um, Speaking of Augustine, one of my favorite books he wrote was a book called Retractations. It's one of his last writings. Actually, was his last writing, where he basically, after a career mentions all the things he's been wrong about. He basically just rips himself to shreds and he said, I believe all this stuff, but this stuff was totally hot garbage. He doesn't use that language, but basically that's what he says. I'm curious, over the last 10 years, tell me one thing, one thing, one major thing that you actually have changed your mind about and why. About Jesus, God, theology, the Bible. What is one thing that you've changed your mind about that's actually been significant in your journey with Jesus? Hmm. Again, folks, on the spot. On the spot, on the spot. Oh, I would quickly answer the first, the first and last books of the Bible, the way I see them, has, has significantly changed. Everything we just finished talking about uh, is a, a major shift for me, having grown up uh, taught and largely convinced of uh, a young earth, a young earth creationist interpretation of Genesis one and two was the only faithful reading. That's inheriting that, and then having that just blown apart by allowing the Hebrew text to come to me as it comes, um, and and then Revelation. So you know, be, growing up with a very specific. Uh, pre-tribulation dispensational rapture the 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 uh the specific kind of rapture that you see in the left behind movies and and it has to pan out that way that's the only faithful and and everything past chapter three of revelation is way in the future so the first readers all the readers except the last readers couldn't know what it meant basically uh, or couldn't experience what it would be and uh and that that has radically shifted and if you were here last night you heard more where I align. So those are just two of, of, of several. However, I, I have shifted toward the beautiful orthodoxy of the church, toward the truth of my prayers are largely almost intuitively triune now. <laughs> like, Father, thank you for sending your son. Thank you for breathing out your spirit and, and enabling your church to commune with you. Like, I'm cognizant that every act of each person of the Trinity is always a triune act. And praying that and knowing that, every act, that's Fred Sanders, Trinitarian dude from Biola. Every act of each person of the triune Godhead is always a triune act in some way. And just communing with him, and that's a shift more consciously into Trinitarianism, which is Christianity, Orthodoxy. So um, I would not only state negative, but also positive shifts in that way. But. Um, I wouldn't say 10, I'd say maybe 20 years. 20 years. Um, it would probably be uh, basically revelation. Um, when I first became a Christian in the church that I became a Christian, it was a multicultural church. It was in colleges where I met Christy and Billy, yay. Um, and we were basically told, these are the last days if we make it to the year 2000. Oh my So, um, yeah, I've kind of, uh, we've been in the last days since Jesus ascended. (laughs) It's been, we've been 2,000 years in the last days. Um, God, um, we don't know the day, we don't know the hour. I don't even believe we know with a decade. Um, We are indeed in the last days because he says we're in the last days, but I don't believe they're as impending as I was led to believe, because it was really used as a scare tactic. We kind of talked about that. As a scare tactic to get a lot of us saved, as students and you know, Christians in the faith. I would, have to, I would say that. Um, 
I'm a writer, and I learned, I've learned to figure out what I think by writing about something. And I've been privileged. I've been a professor. I'm in more than four decades now as a professor. And um, I've been privileged to be able to devote my life to studying the Bible and to be able to read and write. And uh, there are things that I wrote when I was young that I wish I had never written. Uh, but I'll defend them like a cat if I have to. Uh, but um, probably in the last 10 years, the, um, it is, the, uh, is my understanding of the Book of Romans, uh, along with my understanding of the Gospel. I had sort of uh, back burner ideas going on that I never had time to work out. So in the book of Romans, I just had this idea and I didn't, I never taught the Apostle Paul as a, as a book. I mean, as just the whole uh, Pauline letters. When I taught at Trinity for 12 years, I didn't teach Paul when I taught at North Park for 17 years. So for nearly 30 years of my life, I was not giving steady lectures on the book of Romans. But I had some ideas that I thought these people who were talking about Romans were just wrong about. So uh, when I started teaching at Northern Seminary 11 years ago, um, one of my first classes was the Pauline letters. I thought, well, it's time to start working some things out. Well, here's, here's what I think. I think most people read the book of Romans um, as sort of a scheme of salvation theoretical, almost systematic theology. And I, I did not believe that Paul wrote like that. I didn't think he wrote a systematic theology. I believe that Paul was a pastor and that everything he wrote was connected to what was happening as in his mission churches. And one of the problems, everywhere he planted a church, you know, Paul was probably not the prototypical pastoral type. You know, I don't think he was a glad hander. Uh, I think he told people what he thought at times. And the book of Romans brings to fruition, into expression, uh, the results of all the problems that he faced in his mission churches with his primary opponents Jewish believers and Jews who wanted to know one basic thing. Do we have to follow the Torah? And Paul said, well, this is an interesting question. And if you read Romans, uh, I'll say two things about this. If you read Romans 1, really, chapter 2, verse 1, through the end of chapter 4, Paul batteries people, batters people with questions. One question after another. Well, why would he do this? And then the same thing happens in Romans 9 through 11, which everybody struggles with, Romans 9 through 11. But Romans 5 through 8 is just so calm. It's so fun. <laughs> well, if you then skip ahead, now that's the first point, is all these questions. And when I translated the New Testament, I made all the questions in bold. So that people would realize that Romans 2 through 4 and 9 through 11 is basically a question and response session with Paul about the questions that he's being asked by Jewish believers about, is God faithful to our Jewish tradition? That's the first point. The second point is this. Paul is addressing two audiences in Romans chapter 14 and 15, the weak and the strong. The weak are Jewish believers who believe that you need to follow the Torah. And the Gentiles, are the, the strong, Paul kind of identifies with it. We who are strong, he says, but that, that just could be rhetorical. He says, we who are strong. The strong are Gentile believers who don't think you have to follow the Torah. Well, as it turns out, Romans 2 through 4 is basically Paul's response to the weak. Romans 9, 1 through 11, 10 is Paul's response to the weak. 
All of a sudden, in 11, 11, and 12, there's a transition. In 11, 13, Paul says, now I'm going to talk to you Gentiles. And they, the way he talks to them, it makes you think that Paul has been going back and forth in this letter, responding to the strong and the weak. This book of Romans is a pastoral letter trying to bring peace in the middle of the empire because the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers are not getting along very well. Because at one point, Claudius kicks out all the Jews. But I think what he kicked out were the Jewish believers. And then they returned under Nero because Nero made things nice for a while. He became a first-class idiot. Nero lost his mind, and he was impossible to live with. He was a neurotic, paranoid. I'm not a psychologist. My wife is. She can give a diagnosis. But it's really nasty. But at the beginning of Nero's emperorship, he is kind to people coming in. And so the Christians, the Jewish believers, the Jews all moved back. When they came back, the Gentiles were in charge of the church. And they had created all kinds of freedom. You know, you can eat shrimp if you want. And it tastes good. All right? And you can eat ham. And I'm telling you, Italian prosciutto is unbelievable. All right? And so all of, a, all of a sudden, these Jewish believers are having to get along with these Gentile believers, but the Gentile believers are in charge. Formerly, the Jewish believers were in charge. That's the book of Romans. It's not a systematic theology. It's a pastoral theology of how Gentiles and Jews should be able to get along. And it's a paradigm for you and me during this election season, which is forever, <laughs> to realize that the strong have a responsibility to care for the weak. And the weak can expect the strong to care for them. That's what that letter is about. And so it's not a systematic theology. It is an amazing letter of pastoral theology. And I was thrilled when a, pu when a publisher said to me, Scott, I want you to write this book and I don't want any footnotes. Because Romans is endless in scholarly discussion. So I got to just write a book called Reading Romans Backwards. that starts with the weak and the strong in Romans 14 to 15. And it was one of the most enjoyable years of my life writing that book. And I changed my mind in a sense because I think I'd been wrong. I just didn't know what I believed. And now I do. And I don't want anybody to tell me I'm wrong because I don't have time to change my mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and it's, it's frustrating to have to change your lectures, too. So, so why would you want to have to go through that process? Yeah. Uh, this will be my last question, and then, and then we'll, we'll move towards the, the, the kind of the open-ended um, free-for-all insanity that will ensue. Um, last evening, uh, Scott, you mentioned this, this idea that uh, the church always, not only always lives in Babylon, but often the church is Babylon, that we can at times live into the ways of Babylon if we, if we are not discerning and mindful. And I know I'm speaking uh, as somebody um, who, you know, I live in Oregon. Oregon is one of the most progressive secular states in the, in the union. Um, when you are a Christian in a place like Eugene or Portland, you often feel like a, a minority and a kind of outsider. There is an immense amount of pressure right now especially on topics like sexuality and gender, our culture, that it's a stifling moment in time where it feels a pressure to need to abandon what God has spoken for the sake of the moment. Can you speak to us just wisdom about how to remain faithful to God in Babylon where the pressures are so strong to abandon God's revealed will and desire? Are you talking about, you want us to talk about LGBTQ? Or are you talking about just Babylon? Yeah. I think for the sake of, um, um, let's do this. I, I'm, I want to be cautious here because I think it's un, unjust to just for a few moments respond to something so sensitive as LGBTQI stuff. Would you speak to just how do you remain faithful to what God has revealed in a Babylonian empire that really is, creates just unending pressure to abandon the, the ways of Jesus. 
Well, I, f I feel like last night, the first point that I made about revelation, about wisdom and discernment of Babylon is important. And last night's talk, you may have caught the emotional moves that I made in the text that when I was talking about Babylon, I was pretty hard nosed about it because that's the feeling of the text. But when I went to witness and to worship, it became more positive and redemptive because that's the feeling of the text. So I try when I'm speaking to keep to the emotions of the text itself and try to live that text as it's being written. I believe that one of the most important things we can do is become increasingly aware as a lifetime project of social realities and what's driving our society. Most of what's driving our society is, uh, and my daughter and I wrote a book called Pivot, it's a new book, um, but it applies here, is below the surface. So if you understand life is a tree, our society is a tree, and we care about the fruit that grows on our peach trees, the branches and the leaves, most of what is important is underground and you can't see it. It's the soil, it's the nutrients, it's the health of the dirt, which is a whole project in and of itself to understand dirt and topsoil in the history of civilization. I believe that we need to become really good at recognizing what's in the soil of our culture. And we have to listen to some of the finest minds in our society who are actually examining these cultural trends rather than thinking that we have simplistic answers. Oh, it's all greed. It's capitalism. It's not that simple. There are so many things driving what is going on in our culture and even in our churches of what's going on uh, that we need to become more socially aware. And, and that, I think, is what John has given to us with the marks of Babylon in Revelation 17 to 19. He was a social critic who came to terms with the corruptions of Rome, and he had the courage to look, you know, to see it and say it. That's hard. It's hard sometimes to find it, and it's even harder sometimes to be a whistleblower to talk about it. So I, I believe that uh, we're going to do ourselves a lot of favor by listening to good social critics who can analyze society. People read David Brooks, um, different people who write in different contexts, um, and there's a lot of them. Um, you know, you've mentioned Gary, Jerry, Gary, yeah. Gary, Gary Brashears. He likes to do this up here in this area. So does a former student of mine, Paul Metzger, uh, who, who's up in Portland. Uh, so I think there's a lot of people who analyze, and. AJ is, is very good at this himself. So, so we need people like, like that. Um, I agree that um, we need to definitely read, listen to people who are actually have their ear to the ground and are studying what is going on. Um, the Bible says there is nothing new under the sun. It also talks about, you know, New Testament and Old, and Old Testament, that you need to know how to read the times and the seasons and all these types of things. And um, there's an excellent essay written almost a century ago by Sir John Gloob. He was a British uh, military general, and he was also a historian. And um, at the time, he, was, he wrote an essay called The Fate of Empires. And he was talking about the 28 empires, at, known empires at that time. Um, 28 known empires going all the way to um, Persia and Assyria and Egypt and Babylon and then the Roman Empire and I mean literally Ottoman Empire all the way up to where he was talking about the British Empire. Okay, now America had not reached its zenith yet. But in this he talks about there are six phases of empire. And the average empire lasts between 208 and 247 years. There's only one empire that, um, that rebooted itself and did back-to-back -back empires. And that was the Roman Empire when it went from a republic to an empire. And that's when it got really evil. And so he talks about there are six 
phases of empire. Um, and when I was reading it, I'm thinking, he's talking about the United States, <laughs> when really he's talking about Great Britain. He talks about their age of pioneering and the age of conquest and the age of commerce, because then you monetize what you conquered. Then he talked the age of affluence. Then he talked about the age of discovery and you know, science and inventions, because now you have all this money, now you're going to you know, do all of these looking for um, new inventions and go to the moon or whatever. And then there's the age of decadence. And we're in all the signs of decadence. He talks about the six attributes of a decadent society. The increasing gap between the wealthiest and the poor. Um, an overblown welfare state in which people, and particularly the wealthiest, gouge as much as they possibly can from the coffers of the state. It talked about an, a, a, um, an overextended army that's just trying to be everywhere all at one time. It talked about an over-sexualized culture in which homosexuality becomes uh, acceptable. Uh, sexually transmitted disease are rampant. Est and also out of wedlock pregnancies. And I'm seriously, I'm reading this and I'm like, oh my goodness. Do the math. And I'm not talking numerology, but subtract 1776 from 2023, you're getting 247 years. Um, and we're doing everything, he says, that empires on the brink of collapse attempt to do. They attempt to, they have to engage in a war because wars always galvanize people together. Now, am I speaking gloom and doom? No, but there's no, I know there's nothing new under the sun and you gotta read the, the, the signs of the times. I, you know, my personal belief is that aside from a radical revival in the church that spills out and into an awakening in the culture, that is where we're going. And if we understood that there are times and seasons, as we said in the beginning, he causes, some nation, he causes all nations to rise and to fall, seems to be patterns and seasons in that. That if we understood it was just time, we would stop pointing the fingers at people and saying it's those migrants, it's those minorities, it's those, you know, socialists, it's those, and like really understand it's just time. And we got about the business of the kingdom and that we began like we were talking about the genetic kind of spiritual DNA, you know, repair that we're doing that we would attempt to remove the tears, if you would, from the culture or identify them so that the seeds of destruction are not woven into whatever the new cloth is. And that whatever the new thing that is birthed comes forth looks more like the kingdom than what we have and what we have had. And that is my mindset for the kingdom. That we are to be not just personally transformed more into the likeness of Christ day by day, but we strive to bring, which when we pray, do we really mean when we say, let thy kingdom come and let thy will be done here on earth? Are we downloading from the dimension where God is into this world that we are in, his will, his kingdom? And that we understand the difference between his kingdom and the default mode of Americanism. And I think if we camp out in that space and hear from people who are listening, these are some changes that we see, these are some indicators, these are some markers, these are, I think that we as Christians would be healthier um, and that we would actually begin to work more together as a body to strive to see his kingdom come and his will be done. So, yeah, I mean, amen. And what, what Scott said about Babylonian branding last night, if you were here, 
um, it, it occurred to, as, as he said, Babylon is so into its own branding. It, it occurred to me, oh my goodness, um, this, what this looks like, I think, what this looks like on the street is when it, we don't see people anymore, but we see issues. When Babylon gets us to see issues first, instead of the people on our, on our street, in our workplace, uh, Babylonian has, you're leaning on the breast of Babylon. And how Babylon wants you to see those people. And how Babylon wants you to see, because Babylon benefits. Babylon benefits when you, when you see issues first, and not people first. But leaning on the breast of Jesus, that's, that is it. Like, like gaining hit. What are Jesus' cortisol levels toward that issue right now? <laughs> I bet the Prince of Peace is exhibiting shalom over whatever's going on. Uh, or are you leaning on the breast of your partisan newsfeed a little too often? Um, because you heard, you, heard that, you heard that branding signal from that person at work, and you're elevated. Um, so, so that, that to me is what I would say to the Prince of Peace versus the branding of Babylon. Well, the purpose of branding is for you, is for the brander, is to grab your loyalty towards itself. Yeah. So it's not just, I just don't want a pair of tennis shoes. I want Nike tennis shoes. All this other stuff is trash. I want the Nike tennis shoes. I want a Tesla. That brand. Now, there are other electric cars, greater mileage, but I want Tesla and that brand loyalty. And our branding is supposed to be Jesus. <laughs> that I don't want anything else. I want brand Jesus. And so when we are looking at brand Jesus and we see Jesus, then we see other people who are Imago Dei, made in his image, and we don't see them as issues and problems. Sometimes people are problems, I'm just, I'm working through it. But, uh, <laughs> but um, we can begin to see that they are made in the image of God, and we are to love them and to serve them and see the kingdom manifested in building the relationships. We, we, yeah. We have, of course, a, a number of writings in the, in the Old Testament where Israel um, actually lived in exile during Babylon. Um, one, one of those texts is, is the book of Daniel. I, this has always caught my attention every time I've read this. And I've read through Daniel a number of times in the last few years. Every time I read this, it catches me. Um, uh, Daniel 9, while D Daniel's pr pr he's talking about, his, he was praying and speaking. He says, while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin, and the sin of my people Israel, and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill. While I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of evening sacrifice. And he instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. That this line right here, uh, that the that Daniel came to, that, that Gabriel came to Daniel during the evening sacrifice. What did not exist when this book was written? What had been destroyed? The temple had been destroyed. He is operating on temple time in Babylon. And I, I, to me, I don't know, it just, I, it's awkward to answer my own question, but it, it seems as though actually maybe a metaphor for the Christian life today is that we exist in kind of a jet lag where we're on a different time frame than the world, and it just makes us a funky fit. And, and that that's okay. It's okay. Let's, um, yeah, distance. Uh, let's, we've got some questions in the room, I think. I hope, yeah. Um, go for it, please. Yeah, make it happen. Raise your hand if you have something to say or something to throw. Yeah, there you go, right there. Wow. First up, great. Yeah. And give so us your working. name if you would, please. Yeah, uh, Russell Hill. Hey, I want to thank you guys for coming all the way out to Roseburg. Today was evidence. <laughs> <clears throat> why we live here. It's the best place in the state, and the Oregon is the best place on the West Coast. So, <laughs> I said, Amen. Amen. 
Anyway, um, I want to go back to what Evan was saying about when you read the Bible, it's open for interpretation. Well, who, you know, gets the retrointerpretation rules, okay? So I was raised in a Pentecostal church, you know? The Word of God is inerrant. I read it. I believe it. End of the story. But now I'm a little more progressive, and so I guess I have a problem with Romans through Revelation, I mean, I can understand you read the Old Testament through the Gospels. But when Paul says, you know, women are the weaker, women can't teach, they can have salvation through childbirth, and even Peter says something like, be submissive. So it's like, who do you look into? The Catholics, Presbyterians, you know, the Methodists, you know, I mean, who's got the the authority on this. And it's like a difficult, it's, I used to be comfortable with, you know, reading the Bible as it says. Now I'm uncomfortable. And, and it's not your fault. It's just, you know. But well, it, it may be Evan's fault, actually. But, we, I don't, know. we don't know. It, it may be. But, you know, when I speak to my Catholic friends, my Methodist friends, Muslim friends, Buddhist friends even, and I say, well, Paul didn't mean that. You can't have to interpret that. But when he talks about salvation by grace, oh, yeah, that's right. So it's like, ah, I got this dissonance here. What about, what about Paul's letters that you say, yeah, perfect, no problem. Read it as it is. But the other stuff you have to interpret. Is that an actual question just for me? <laughs> no, no, I mean, okay. I, I, I'm throwing it out. It's just, okay, I mean, good. I like you say, well, but this question rolls back to, Yes. Who has the authority to interpret? And, and you know, I'm a woman. What I'm teach, what teaching do you follow? <laughs> yeah. yeah. How do you? I want to see you mansplain this. <laughs> <laughs> because I know in my heart, you know, women are not the weaker creature. You know, they'd make better presidents, better leaders. Yeah. Um, bless you. Bless you. <laughs> I, just a slight correction. Paul didn't talk about the weaker vessel. Peter did. So let's blame Peter uh, on that one. But all these texts about women in the New Testament have to be read in light of all the texts in the Bible about women. You can't just take 1 Corinthians 14, 34b through 35 and 1 Timothy 2, 10 through 17 and think now we've got our answers. Because the Paul, who if he wrote 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35, which is a big issue, um, is also writing in a letter that allows women to pray and prophecy. And Paul calls prophecy the greatest of gifts. So there. Uh, so that, that, that is a, that's a very important thing. I think we have to look at the whole page, all the scripture on women. And we have to ask this very serious question. This church needs to ask this question. And I don't know anything about this church about this. Well, a little bit. But, it's, but this is not a backhanded question. You have to ask this question. Do we allow women to do in our church what women did in the Bible? Now, if you study all the women in the pages of the Bible you've got some pretty dynamic situations, all right? You got Miriam interpreting the Exodus. You have, um, you have Huldah being chosen as the prophet when there were other male prophets around. You got Deborah who did everything. She was the, the queen, she was the prophet, she was the judge, she was the warrior, all right? Those are leadership positions. And you got Mary, who's talked about in the Gospels more than everybody but Jesus and Peter. All right? And we Protestants only accept Mary at Christmas. And then we wrap her up in the creche, pat her on the bottom, and tell her not to come back till next December. <laughs> but Mary, Mary is the one who taught Jesus. I want you to read the Magnificat in Luke 1, 46 to 55, I think are the verses. And then ask at the end of every verse, 
what did Jesus say about this? And you're going to discover that the hand that rocked Jesus' cradle changed the world. And then we have Phoebe, who is the one who delivered the book of Romans from Cancrea to Rome. And when she delivered that letter, she read that letter to those churches. There are at least five house churches in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 16. She read that letter aloud, and not one of you in this room has probably ever read the book of Romans aloud to a group of people that got to ask questions, and she answered those questions. So Phoebe was the first interpreter of the book of Romans. All right, and then you've got Junia in Romans 16. She's an apostle, not someone who's liked by apostles, but an apostle. And not only that, Chrysostom, who could read Greek better than any of us, said that she was a great apostle. Not just apostle, but an esteemed apostle. All right. Mary shows up in Revelation chapter 12, and Protestants don't even see her. That's how blinded they are to the mother of Jesus. So here's what I'm saying. You want to silence women? You got to cut out a lot of passages in the Bible. So that's not what Paul meant. So I believe that churches need to ask the question. I'm preaching here, but that's all right. I'm acting like Lakita. <laughs> right here in Rosebud. <laughs> but so many people have said to me, we're so glad you came all the way. I think this is a great city. I think it's... There's nothing, there's nothing to be sorry about in Roseburg. I think it's a beautiful place. Yeah. It's a lot quieter than Chicago, I'll tell you that right now. So I don't know what I was on, but it was a really good point about, <laughs> about, about the, if we're going to start reading 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy 2 and silencing the other passages, it's unbiblical to the core. Let women do what the Spirit has gifted them to do. Move on. Okay. All right. He answered the question. Yeah. Right over here. Right over here. Right over here. Yep. Hi, I'm Kelsey. Hi, Kelsey. I've met you, AJ. Of um, so my favorite uh, chapters in the Bible are Genesis, Roman, and Revelation, simply because I really enjoy the challenge of understanding truth. And so my question is, uh, my mom, she believes that each of us individually will see the end times, much like how you mentioned the endless Babylon. I believe there's a slow buildup uh, with each generation to see kind of like a taste of what the final times will look like in, in the very end. Can you kind of elaborate on the end times and whether it's something that's that, em, eh, that endless Babylon will take part of forever or is there an ending? Because I was also taught that in Revelations or Revelation, it was simply a vision given to John by God. So explicitly uh, that the final trumpet, or I mean explicitly the final trumpet, God does tell John to keep his mouth shut. Don't, don't tell anybody what, what I'm telling you here. So can you elaborate a little on that? Let me just throw this out there. That, you know, the Bible says we're in the last times since you know, it was first said in the New Testament, you know, in the last times. And so, the kingdom of God you know, John the Baptist shows up. And he's the first person who announces it. And Jesus preaches the kingdom of God. And then um, it kind of is lastly mentioned probably in the first part of Acts. And at the same time, if the kingdom of God is building, would it not be common sense that the devil is building his kingdom as well? And it's taking forms and shapes. And so... Like our brother here, Scott, said, hey, Babylon is everywhere at all times. And that's because the devil has not been at his final judgment. He's continuously trying to build his kingdom as well. And so every generation does get to see it. Because he's working throughout the world to acquire more and more power that his kingdom would try to send. And he did tell Jesus, see all these kingdoms? I'll give them to you. Just bow down to me. And so 
Um, I think that we need to be less, I don't want to use the word obsessed, but giving less attention to trying to spot Babylon and the kingdom of darkness than we spend time trying to build in the kingdom of God. That's just my little part. And um, the more we worship the lamb, the more we'll see the, the dragon. We'll, we'll be able to detect it. Um, the book of Revelation has to be read as visionary, as imaginary, in the sense that it stimulates our imagination to think of this world differently than we do. And I think the big idea is this. Randy Harris said it this way. He's a preacher in Texas. God's team wins. Choose your team. Don't be stupid. <laughs> and there's a lot of truth in that about the book of Revelation. Is the book of Revelation does say that in the end, God's peaceful, just world will be established. And the Lamb will be the temple. All right, and that evil will be eliminated so that we will no longer be distracted by temptation, etc. And we will worship and live in God's world the way God wants us. So I think if we take the big vision, that's what we can look forward to. And I totally agree with Lakita. The kingdom of God has been launched with Jesus. It has not been consummated, but has been launched. And we participate in that kingdom in the church, I think the church and the kingdom need to be connected tighter than a lot of people do, is the church is right now, uh, has the opportunity to, to be a witness and to be the kingdom reality that our world can see. So, yeah. So good. Question. Yeah, go for it. Uh -huh. Okay. <clears throat> Well, uh, my goal is to ask the hardest question, so uh, we'll see if that works. Uh, it's related to AJ's last question to you guys uh, about surviving in Babylon, but this one's more focused towards uh, thriving, you know, bringing more people to Jesus. Uh, so uh, considering that self-identifying Christians have steadily decreased and sexual morality has declined drastically compared to hundred years ago. Uh, what do you think has caused it? And what can Christians do to reverse it that we haven't already tried? Um, if I could jump in, I actually want to um, point to the work of folks like Rebecca McLaughlin, who've written, she wrote Confronting Christianity. So everything you said pertains to a small bubble uh, in the West. Where, where Christianity appears to be declining and is if you focus on the West. But guys like Timothy Tennant at Asbury and Rebecca McLaughlin, who's pull, pulled a bunch of sociology, they're looking at conversion rates and church growth outside of our niche Western bubble. The church is exploding. And the average Christian is a 23-year-old brown woman from some village somewhere who is on fire with Pentecostal passion and for the presence of Jesus invading her, her town and preaching the gospel like crazy. Uh, the average Christian is not uh, uh, this, this room and, and globally. And the, and it's, and the church is exploding uh, in, all, in, in the majority world. And so your question, I think, rightly pertains to our world that God has called us to inhabit. Like why... I just, that's, that's actually the only way I wanted to answer this question was to like frame it in that's the global good. picture because, uh, and, and again, Rebecca McLaughlin confronting Christianity, the first, the introduction to her book is radically encouraging uh, with all the footnotes you can, you can want um, to see, to see what God is doing abroad. Uh, it, we are in the minor, the vast minority where the church is in rapid decline. And actually, um, and I'm no sociologist, um, but the, 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 the folks that study 
uh, global Christian trends are all, I mean, just blaring right now that uh, actually the largest, one of the fastest moving uh, Christian revivals known in Christian history is taking place in Iran today. And it is almost entirely driven by people having dreams about Jesus and female pastors. Um, so these are house churches led by women yeah. and people <laughs> meeting Jesus uh, through dreams. Praise the Lord. Um, and I think, uh, yeah. yeah, I really like talking with you. It's yeah. really, you get me excited. Yeah. Just to, yeah. that, all that to say, um, uh, to Evan's point, uh, if we spend our entire life living on our newsfeed on, on social media, we assume what's happening on our newsfeed is what's happening across the world. But that's a very small snippet of what's taking right. place in the world today. I heard you once do a five to one ratio thing on a podcast, AJ. Like for every, for every one deconstructing Western oh. Portlander or whatever, mm -hmm. there's yeah. five. What was that? Well, the, I don't have any sociological backing to that other than anecdote. Uh, how, however, that said, um, when we see somebody walk away from their faith, I wrote a book called After Doubt, which is about deconstruction, doubt, and how you walk through this stuff. We feel that so acutely. We feel it so real because these are our sons. These are our daughters. These are our cousins. These are our parents. And that has such a disproportionate weight on our emotions that we assume that what our kids are doing is what everybody is doing. But when you yes. look at the globe, yes. what is happening in my household is yeah. not what's happening in Iran. And we've got to not conflate the two. The kingdom is coming. It's just not always evident in our news feed. Amen. So maybe, Amen. maybe, maybe we should not live in our news feed. Amen. 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 Um, amen to that. Um, and I think we really need to expand what we're talking about as far as I'm all about the kingdom, mm. but that doesn't mean I'm a Christian nationalist. Quite the contrary. Our brothers and sisters are those Christians or people who are coming to Christ yes. in Iran. Come on. I know this is going to blow some of y'all away, but the country, the nation with the largest number of Christians is China. Those are our brothers and sisters there, many of them being persecuted. And we have got to get out of this American Christianity in which we have conflated um, the kingdom with Christianity. I'm not I'm sorry, the kingdom with Americanism or America is the city on a hill, is the promised land is the end all, is the country that's gonna save the world uh, from the devil or whatever destruction that we're thinking. And we know that we have some of that in us when we turn on that news feed. And we are less offended about what is happening to our Christian brothers and sisters than we are when we see that the Bible has been swapped out for the Constitution. We're more passionate about the Constitution than we are the Bible. We have exchanged the cross for the flag. We have exchanged the Lord's Prayer, and Jesus said, pray like this for the Pledge of Allegiance. When we have exchanged hymns and the psalms that David sang for the national anthem. And when we become more passionate about those things, and even right now, while I'm saying it, yes. there's something going on in there. And that's when we know we got to take that to the cross. Come on. Because it is God and kingdom. Yes. And our, in the kingdom that we belong to, our brothers and sisters are in Asia, they're in Africa, they're in parts of Europe, they're in Australia, wherever Jesus followers are, that is our family. Yes. Those are the citizens of the kingdom that we belong to and that we are ambassadors of. And so when we're talking about 
living in Babylon. We were talking uh, today, um, chilling, hanging out today. And um, <laughs> we were talking about uh, Babylon and how do you be a dissident in Babylon? Um, African Americans, in many ways, we identify with the Babylonian captivity in that the Babylonian Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and the big Negro, they were kidnapped. <laughs> Their names were changed, okay? And here they had to survive in this dominant culture. And in that dominant culture, they had a subculture. They had that hour you were talking about. There's no temple, but there's that hour. The dominant culture did not know about that hour, but they were able to relate to one another. There's a whole black world y'all don't know about. It. But you can and, and resist at the same time. We have got to start reading. We want to learn how to be a dissident. We've got to start reading the Bible differently. We have to start empathizing not with Goliath, but with David. And we don't really know that we're em empathizing with Goliath or even Babylon. Because there's only really one kind of era where Israel was on the top. That was David and, you know, this great, you know, Israeli kingdom. But if you look at the Bible, Abraham goes into Canaan. And it's just one little family. And it's all these other Canaanites around them. Then they go into Egypt, and they're enslaved for 400 years under the, under the most powerful and the wealthiest nation the world had seen at that time. Then they got to fight their way through Canaan to receive their promised land and fight the giants, and still they're the little man. And they get up to the part of David, and finally they kind of have like this triumphalism kind of thing going on, right? Didn't last very long. You know, Solomon, that was great, and his great splendor. Then the kingdom gets torn in two and you have all this stuff. And then they're carried into Babylon where they're a small minority group of people in this dominant culture where they're enslaved. And then when they come back, they still have the threats of people because their walls have been torn down and they gotta, they're trying to survive. And then there's the Roman occupation. And so most of the Bible is about a small group of people who are a minority. They're a remnant in an oppressive world, whether it's Canaan, whether it's Egypt, whether it's Babylon, whether it's Rome, that is so massively bigger than they are. And if we just learn to read the Bible differently and to see it from the perspective of where they were when it was written and how they were seeing everything. Right now, you know, America was once a colony and they saw themselves as David fighting Goliath, which is, you know, the British Empire. But the reality is, is that we've grown up and America is now Goliath. And we still think we're David. And how dare those people, you know, be upset that we can't just come in and take their oil, you know? And like, somehow they're Goliath and we're David. And we don't really put the mirror up for self-reflection. So um, I know we always want to see ourselves as the good characters in the Bible, but sometimes we might act like Saul. Head and shoulders above everyone else, but kind of cowardly. We don't see that. Are we of the boss who's really acting like, you know, some of the characters in Babylon who are mistreating? You know, are we acting like, as our boss... Like acting like Haman, or could it be us that we're acting like Haman towards some of our employees? So if we want to learn how to be dissidents, we have to read the Bible for the majority of the Hebrew existence, you know, in these books. How is it that we don't see what a dissident looks like? Because that's what they were most of the time. And even now, everywhere they go around the world, there are small group of people. They're a small group of people. And wherever they go, they're constantly on guard. But they are regime proof. Okay. Because I tell people this is not a, the Bible's not a book. It's a library of 66 books. And it's got the history, the literature, the law, the prose, the, you know, all these things. It's 
They're regime proof that no matter where they go, they're taking their library with them and they're setting up shop because they know they're going to be dissidents wherever they go. So what will help us is we've got to kind of come out of our triumphalism. We rush on the city. We run on the wall. I mean, that was just one little error in the Bible. Okay. <laughs> the rest of the time, the Hebrew nation, the Hebrew people, the Israelites, Abraham, they were small. And they were always under attack from the larger, more powerful, more wealthy nation that they occupied. Yeah, go for it, please. Raise your hand, please. Yeah, there you go. There you go. This is a question for Scott. Scott, you have a pr provocative title of a book out there. I don't think it was branding. The Bible isn't enough. And you talk about uh, there's more that we need. And you, you also have Tove, and you talk about the toxic culture of the church. And what are some things that are toxic more broadly that you're seeing in, a, in, in congregational life or church life? And what are some of the ways that we can not only discern that, but do something about it? Yeah, the, uh, my editor thought the Bible is not enough was a pretty clever title for, it was supposed to be an essay, it was going to be published as a booklet, but he liked it, so he turned it into a book. Uh, but it's about developing a peaceful imagination, and we can't, the Bible doesn't give us everything we need to know about how to live in our world, so we have to extrapolate and use our imagination at times. Okay. That has nothing to do, unfortunately, with Toxic and Tove. But my daughter and I um, wrote a book called A Church Called Tove, which is um, a mapping of the traits of toxicity in toxic churches um, matched by Christian virtues that should overcome it. So they are the Tove. Tove is the Hebrew word for good or goodness. So in the Revelation... I mean, in Genesis, God created the world and it was Tov. All right. Mao Tov is the, it, it's, it's uh, totally good at the end. So the, um, we need to become aware of toxic patterns in our churches. And um, this is a very sensitive topic to me, to our family. We've experienced it. And I also know that it's easier to criticize churches and pastors than it is to be truthful and accurate. And when you go on Twitter, it can become inaccurate and very explosive. So um, I think what we need to become aware of are some major toxic patterns, and that is that we have... I'm not talking about your church. I don't know enough about your church to be saying anything about your church. But I'm just saying that after my daughter, Laura Berenger, and I wrote this book, for the next 15 months, we heard between two and five stories a week from churches and people in churches who had been spiritually abused by power abuse. So I have a lot of stories to tell about this. The, the, the major traits that I would be looking for are narcissism, oh. narcissistic personality disorder. You need to read about this stuff. And don't be a, you're not a psychologist to diagnose people, but you can see narcissistic tendencies in the, the quest for grandiosity, for sensitivity to any kind of criticism, to the use of power with fear to motivate people to conform or to get out of the picture. When you see patterns of people being released from the church or the business or the institution too quickly and too often, you're probably seeing some patterns of abuse. And we need to be aware of this, but we need more important than that is to start focusing on the sorts of things that can build cultures of Tove in church. Cultures of Tove in church are focused on character formation rather than numbers. We, we measure how many people come to church. We do not measure how many people have grown Christ-like. Mm -hmm. It's a lot harder to measure the latter than the former, so we go to the former. 
we need to focus on good examples and uh, nearly every example we've used in our books has turned out to be a problem. So uh, we have, I have a rule with my daughter, the only people we can talk about are dead. Okay, and we know their stories. Although I found a couple that I really liked that were dead, and then I found out, oh my. But here's a good example, Mr. Rogers. He's gonna win every time. Just use him as your story, all right? Fred Rogers, uh, and everybody who studied his life and studied him knew that this guy was the real thing. And in everywhere he was, he was always alike. But we need to focus on that, and we need to start working on individual issues in our churches that need improvement. And here, here's in Pivot, the book that we talk about, and I didn't know about the scene in Friends about Pivot. Uh, evidently, this is quite the scene. And my daughter said, we can't call the book Pivot because everybody will be laughing about the Friends scene. Do you know? See? See? Huh? They're moving a couch up the stairs. Pivot! And he's yelling, pivot! And so I said, well, we're going to call it pivot anyway. Um, here's something that I learned from a student of mine who did a PhD in organizational transformation. It takes seven years for an organization to transform its culture when it is committed to transformation. Getting a church totally to be committed to transformation is a miracle. All right. So we need to be patient with the transformation that occurs in churches by the grace of God, through the power of the Spirit, by, as we follow the example of Christ. But we need, uh, we need to begin focusing on this more because I can just tell you, hundreds of stories have come my way of power abuse in churches. When pastors are narcissistic, we have a denial of the gospel. A pastor friend wrote me the other day. It's a woman pastor. And she said, can narcissists be saved? That's a great question. <laughs> I went, oh, well, I, I said, yes, but they won't be transformed. They're the hardest per people to work with. Ask my wife. She's a psychologist. It's really difficult. All right, and, and we have created, seminaries are partly to blame. Mega churches are more to blame. We have created platforms that attract people who are really good on platforms rather than who have the character of Christ likeness to pastor people. Amen or oh my. So, and, I, and I'm not, I, I love pastors. That, that's my people, all right? But I know that there are problems there and we have a culture that, has been, that needs to be transformed. Mega churches are not the model. Uh, Redeemer's Fellowship in Roseburg, Oregon. This is a normal church. All right. Evid evidently, evidently the, the, the time for the children is up. <laughs> Evan, you did so good, buddy. You did great. Scott, you did great. Lakita. Oh, my goodness, girl. You're amazing. How about it for all these guys? Yeah, you're right. Uh, our child care is about to end, so <laughs> that's what this is all about. Can I just say that Christy and I and Steve Grace came from one of the 250 biggest churches in America... I worked there for 10 years and it is one of the deepest regrets that I have that I spent so many years and so many hours and a lot of sweat and honest work unto the Lord. But a lot of those years were underneath a narcissistic leader. And I don't, I don't ever want to do that again. I don't want that again. So Steve Grace and I, sometimes Christy will be in my office. If you ever come by the church and, and maybe you'll peek in the window and we're, we're just talking and maybe there's some tears. It's, 
it's usually that we're, we're trying to pray for each other so that our hearts can be healed from where we just came from. And that's a journey, but what we are committed to is, is a healthy ministry. It's not going to be a perfect ministry. And our model is not a mega church. We don't know how big a church is going to be, and it's going to be what it's going to be. That's God's, that's God's sovereign decision. But we do know that we're going to try our best to reach as many people as we can and then disciple them deeply as best we can with the time that we're given. And then, and then we'll pass that baton. And then you'll find me maybe roaming the Alps of Switzerland until I croak. <laughs> I know that we want to finish. Billy, can I just speak over you for a moment? Something. Can I have permission to speak brother to brother to you? Um, I made a, it was interesting last evening. I felt myself in my spirit a little guilty. Scott and I tucked our shirts in. Oh, hold on. And you didn't. And I, I kind of made fun of you. Hold on. Hold on. Don't yell. Hold on. I sort of joked with you. And I said something, and you started to tuck in, and I all of a sudden felt like bad that, that I had said something. And you were okay being the butt of my joke. And I want to say to you, I have the gift of knowing you. You are such a loving human being who is not full of himself. This church is so lucky to have you. I just want you to know from the outside, this is a gift and you're doing phenomenal work here. We love you, Billy. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I deeply appreciate that. So very kind. So very kind. And so, and so we, we learn and we grow and, and, and we have moments like this where we get to sit and soak in the wisdom and in the knowledge and the understanding and the impartation of some of the finest people, some, some of the finest minds, some of the finest pastors and professors. And I really don't know what you do, Lakita. Uh, I, I've known you for 32 years. I, I don't know what your job is. <laughs> uh, but what you do is, is you change, you change, you point people to Jesus and you, and you bring the light of Christ wherever you go. And that's very evident. So I'm going to just close us in prayer and, uh, and just uh, try, to, try to kind of capture this moment, if you would, please, uh, for just a moment. But let's all bow our heads. And so, Lord, we come to you now in the name of Jesus. And we're so very, very grateful for the opportunity these, these three nights and this morning to, to hear your scriptures taught. And to hear that the scriptures taught through some amazing people whom, whom you've transformed and who've devoted their lives to you, Jesus, and, and devoted their lives to the study of these scriptures and then how to live them out. And I'm just praying, Lord, that you would help us to just absorb and to, to receive and to digest spiritually what we're learning. And then, Lord, that we wouldn't just be hearers, but we would be doers by your grace. And um, we thank you, God, for the blessing of, of being in a, a, a small town and we're kind of tucked away and, and, we're, and we're, there's a couple of rivers and a, and a bunch of trees and people just fly right by. And, and yet, Lord, you've called us to this place to reach people, to show and share the love of Christ. And, and so, Lord, help us to do that well. And we just pray, Lord our church's blessing to be upon our, our friends as they travel home all around the country. And Lord, I pray that maybe your Holy Spirit would, would refresh them. They've worked very hard, but Lord, help, help to refresh them as they go home. And Lord, help them to have a little bit of Roseburg, a little bit of Redeemers in their heart as they go back to their, their daily lives. And so we just thank you, God, again, for this opportunity. Thank you for all of the hard work of everyone who, who, who worked diligently to organize and put this together. 
And uh, we love you, Jesus. And Lord, help us to live in Babylon. Help us to understand the times that we're in. And um, help us to have Babylon goggles on. And then, Lord, know when to take those off and just sit at your feet. And so we love you, Jesus, and we thank you, and we're just so blessed. And so we pray all of these things in your beautiful name, the lovely name of Jesus, and we all said amen. 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 All right, let's give one more round of applause to everyone, please.